Hello and welcome to our webinar, Trump, Biden, and the Future of Christian Nationalism, hosted by the Center on Religion and Culture at Fordham University here in New York. I'm David Gibson, director of the CRC, and this is the second of a two-part series on this topic of religious nationalism that we're co-sponsoring with my colleagues at Fordham's Orthodox Christian Studies Center. In that first conversation, which was on October 29th, a couple days before, before the election, my colleague and co-director of the Orthodox Christian Studies Center, Aristotle Papanicolaou, led a discussion with Jose Casanova at Georgetown University, Elizabeth Prodromu at Tufts University, and Eric Gregory at Princeton University, a colleague of one of our panelists, uh, Eddie Glaude. And in introducing that panel, um, Telly noted that their conversation really flowed from the global context. It was focused more on uh, Christian orthodoxy, from the global context to the national, the more particular perspective. Here today, two days after the uh, presidential election, uh, we're going in the other direction, really from the national scene in the United States to the, to the global context, but really with the same goal to explain and analyze this phenomenon of religious nationalism, uh, where we see it, what it is, and where we go from here, if we can go from here. To that end, we have a superb lineup of panelists, all friends of Fordham, I would say, having all having taken part in uh, other uh, past events at Fordham. First, we have Eddie Glaude, Jr., chairman of the Department of African American Studies at Princeton University, and president of the American Academy of Religion. He's a well-known commentator on religion and politics, and his most recent book, a powerful book, is Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and Its Urgent Lessons for Our Own. And then we also have next uh, Robert P. Jones, CEO and founder of the Public Religion Research Institute, PRRI, a terrific, uh, just uh, one of the best um, survey institutes out there for issues of religion and culture. He's a leading commentator on all these issues, and he's also the author of his most recent book, White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity. That's a follow-up to his uh, book, I think, from 2016, The End of White Christian America. And both um, Eddie and Robbie are from natives of Mississippi which is an interesting juxtaposition. Not from Mississippi, however, is our third panelist, Christina Stockel, a uh, professor of sociology at the University of Innsbruck. She's joining us from Austria. Uh, Christina is currently principal investigator of the research project, Post-Secular Conflicts. This effort examines connections between the Russian Orthodox Church and global networks of the Christian right. I would just um, direct everyone to her. I'll, I'll put the uh, link in our chat sidebar to her um, keynote, uh, talk, her keynote talk at the, um, uh, at the um, European Academy of Religion earlier this year. On that topic, it was really superb. 30 minutes well worth your time. So let's, um, we, are here again 48 hours or so after the um, after the uh, election. Still not exactly sure who uh, who has won, but it looks like it's going to be Joe Biden, um, and we can talk more about that. Um, but let's first. I want to go to Robbie Jones, and we're going to let uh, Robbie share his screen, and he's going to take us through. Your, he's the the numbers guy, in, in addition to an analysis guy. And he's going to take us through some of the numbers that may give us an indication of where the Christian and Christian nationalist vote went uh, in this November 3rd election. Robbie, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, David. So glad to be with you, Eddie, and with Christina uh, as well. Um, so just kind of, I'll keep the kind of opening brief because I know we'll have a lot to talk about. Um, but, you know, one one thing I'll just start with is just a personal uh, thing. You know, um, one of the remarkable things about this election cycle, um, as someone who, who writes survey questions, are the kinds of survey questions we had to write to understand what was going on in the country. 
this year. And, and one in particular, I think that stands out to me um, uh, was we, we had to ask um, this right on the topic here, whether Americans thought that the sitting president of the United States was encouraging white supremacist groups with his decisions and behavior. And we found that six in 10 Americans uh, today said that they thought that he was doing exactly that, that, that our sitting president was encouraging white supremacist groups with his decisions and behavior. Um, I, I was, you know, both as I, I mean, sort of shaking my head as I was writing that, you know, as, as our team was writing that survey question, um, and then shaking my head as we got the results back, uh, that this is where we are, six and 10. Um, uh, agreeing with that with that statement. Um, so, so having said that, um, you know, and, and when we look at the divides, um, also I was I was kind of going back and also reading um, from a Christian standpoint, like reading H. Richard Niebuhr's uh, The Social Sources of Denominationalism. Um, you know, it was written a hundred years ago, but one of the things he he said in there that I think we just become so accustomed to living with uh, that we just blow right past it. Um, he, he talked about um, you know that the the divides of race and caste inside the Christian church, uh, and that he called it like a scandal, um, you know, that, that, that we would draw what he, you know, he was using the terms of the day, draw the color line in the church of, of Jesus Christ, um, and, and called that a scandal. And there is, uh, if you look at the religious landscape today, and this has been true for decades, really, it's been true since the passage of the civil rights movement, I should point that out, this is where we get the divides. Um, that uh, it, if you ask me to describe the, the landscape um, of any particular presidential election, I would say this, uh, that white Christian groups tend to vote for Republican presidents and everybody else tends to vote for Democratic presidents. But this white Christian, uh, really it was a white Christian flight to the Republican party began uh, with the passage of the Civil Rights uh, Acts in the, in the mid 1960s and it culminates with Reagan. It really kind of comes, it co coalesces uh, with Reagan and has been there ever since. And maybe one of the things to say um, about our election results is how um, uh, unremarkable they are against that history. They look very, very similar. In other words, we haven't seen a lot of shifts. Uh, Trump didn't change the game in 2016, and he didn't change it uh, now. Um, and I'll put up, I'm going to put up just two quick slides here to kind of give you a couple of, of things from uh, the uh, from the election itself, because I know everybody's kind of, that's top of mind uh, for everyone. Uh, so this first one um, I'm putting up here is white evangelical or born again, vote for Trump 2016 versus 2020. Uh, this is data from the national election pool exit polls in both 2016 and 2020. And I've also supplemented with um, this additional set of data we have from the Associated Press and the AP VoteCast uh, data source as well. You can see they're very, very consistent um, across here. I think that's the biggest thing to say um, is that in 2016, uh, Trump got 80%. Uh, of white evangelical votes um, uh, in the NEP exit poll to get 76 and in the AP vote cast 81. These are right in line. And then you'll see kind of across, I kind of picked a few of these uh, states that we've been watching um, that, dem that have experienced a lot of demographic change over the past decades or so. Uh, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Texas, along the South, the Sun Belt, and then Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, uh, up across the Rust Belt in the upper Midwest. Um, what you'll see, though, is this very, very consistent. You can kind of draw, you know, if you had a ruler, you could draw a straight line across here. You would not see a lot of fluctuations uh, here. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things to say um, is that, uh, that, the, that in Georgia, North Carolina, Texas, uh, white evangelicals, because of their overwhelming support for Trump um, in this last election cycle and, and in 2016, were the entities sort of really acting as kind of an anchor uh, for these uh, these states, really holding them back from the demographic changes in the state, really showing up and and being uh, and and reaching a tipping point at the, at the ballot box. They turn out at high rates uh, and then vote in overwhelming numbers um, for Trump. And we we just saw no no real uh, space here uh, between 2016 um, and 2020. Uh, the missing bars over here are just data that doesn't exist uh, from the uh, NEP exit poll. Uh, but I have included the data here from AP VoteCast, which again shows very, very consistent, uh, whether whether we're in the Midwest or the Deep South or the National, very, very consistent, um, no shift uh, here um, really to speak of. And then the next one um, I want to point to, which is relevant to this conversation, I think, is, is this, that um, the, the divisions around systemic racism have, they have, they have been 
uh, you know, with us, as I said, since Reagan. I mean, this is really what gives us the composition of the two political parties that we have, with the Republican Party being approximately seven and 10 white and Christian, the Democratic Party being a little bit more than a third uh, white and Christian. Uh, and, and it gives us these cleavages along lines of race and religion. But we see in this exit poll, I think, just very, very clear evidence of how deep the divide is over systemic racism. So the three, there's three questions from uh, the NEP um, exit poll. Uh, on the left, uh, whether you have an unfavorable opinion of the Black Lives Matter movement, I've kind of put these all in the same direction. Whether you agree that the US criminal justice system treats all people fairly rather than saying uh, that it treats black people unfairly um, and that the racism in the US is a minor problem or no problem at all. Um, the, the, uh, and what you see here is that folks on that side, Americans on that side of these questions uh, voted overwhelmingly more than eight and 10 uh, uh, for President Trump. We know that white Christian numbers are driving uh, these numbers. We can't quite break them out in the exit polls as they stand, but from other research, uh, we know that white Christian attitudes are, uh, are absolutely um, driving these numbers. And the last thing I'll say is that, you know, we often think of the big divisions in, in the country um, as around abortion, for example, um, which is certainly, you know, a, a divisive issue, but these divides are bigger. Uh, the, the divides around abortion are it's like 75-25, so these, this, this, this divide on the, the very question of systemic racism in the country has become the primary cleavage between our parties and, and the thing that is you know, really ripping the country apart. Thanks very much, uh, Ravi. That, that, that's a, a great way to set the stage. Eddie, um, you know, how, what is, Eddie Glaude, what is your take on um, those numbers and, and the outcome? I mean, one thing, you know, the, uh, uh, Ravi did rightly talk about how this is a long-standing divide. I mean, we've always said uh, America is never as divided uh, by race as it is on Sunday morning. That's why we have black churches. Right. You know, we have, um, but something seems different under Trump. He validated something. I mean, he had more votes among Christians in, a, in absolute terms in 2020 than he did in 2016. What do you make of, of what happened? So I think it's right. I think, first of all, I'm so excited to be on a panel with Robbie and Chris. So this is, this is exciting to talk about this, this historic moment. I think we need to say that you're, we're, it's, it's right to say that this is a longstanding problem. But I also want to suggest that the election of Barack Obama exacerbated it in particular sorts of ways. And so it, it is, we can think about the divide, how it was expressed prior to Obama's election and how in his presidency and how this divide has been expressed post Obama's presidency. And I think we can, my intuition, my instinct suggests that we can probably chart some interesting distinctions, right? And differences in this way, in, the, in, in this moment. So it seems to me that Donald Trump is the kind of culmination of the reaction to Barack Obama's election and the demographic shifts that undergird it, right? Now, what's so fascinating about this moment for me uh, is that for four years, uh, the American public has been witnessed, we have witnessed um, um, at least three things, right? Incompetence, uh, that uh, President Trump for four years has in some ways failed um, as head of state. Uh, that incompetence has evidenced itself in terms of how he uh, manage or, or is managing uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Over 230,000 Americans are dead. 110 plus thousand have been infected today. Uh, we think about 1,600 died yesterday. They're projecting out that by the time uh, the new president it takes the oath of office, over 400,000 Americans uh, uh, will be dead. Uh, so incompetence all around. Then there's, of course, mendacity. He's been lying every single day since he took the oath of office. And then the evidence of profound corruption and graft and greed uh, that has haunted this uh, administration. And we see large millions of Americans still voting for. We still see uh, numbers of Christian, white Christians voting for him. And we need to maybe think about what these adjectives and nouns are doing. We, we might need to flip it, Christian white, whatever. I mean, we need to begin to think about the way in which whiteness is overdetermining one's Christian commitments in these instances. Now the pundit class, a part, uh, happen to be a part of that every now and then, right? Would 
we were making these sorts of claims about you know, the evidence around incompetence, mendacity, and corruption, the way in which Trump governed, that he was simply governing to his base, that he, he wasn't being politically smart because folk were making the claim that he would alienate white suburban voters, white college educated voters, um, and he could not add to his base. So the political arithmetic was such that he was operating only in a kind of narrow space. And Trump, I made this claim and, and it was, wasn't taken up to, to, people didn't take it too seriously initially. But the strategy, it seems, was that, you know, if we look at the number of, of Americans who did not vote, just the raw numbers, there were more white Americans who didn't vote than there were Americans of color and the like. And so the idea was to activate those disaffected white voters. And how did Trump and his campaign seek to do so? Well, hatred, white grievance, white resentment, and the like. The very things that many people, many persons in the pundit class would say, uh, are argued that this would alienate the white suburbs, would alienate white women in particular, it would alienate white college educated folks. But what did we see? What have we seen so far is that Trump has actually increased the number of white voters. That we've seen uh, uh, an extraordinary turnout across the board. He's maybe losing, losing some white suburbs in, 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 in Philadelphia, around Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and the like, but for the most part, his numbers, he's been o overperforming in all of these areas. And, my, and Robbie, of course, can correct me if I'm wrong. But the point that I think is being revealed here is that at the heart of this election rests the central contradiction at the heart of this fragile democracy. Race continues to choke the life out of American democracy in this country. So that people, after four years of witnessing incompetence that has led to unimaginable death, mendacity that has undermined the very integrity of the office and corruption and graft that they have turned out at this scale to vote for this man. It shows us that our democracy is in deep trouble. Yeah, it's one of those things that uh, every time he does something beyond the pale, so many people on Twitter where we all live <laughs> too much, you know, say, oh, this is really gonna turn the, the tide. And I keep saying, no, this is a resume builder for him. This is, you know, these, you just, a after a while, you realize some of these things don't, they don't hurt. The, the evidence seems to, to show they help. Uh, Christina Stockel, let's uh, t turn to you. Uh, you you're in, in Austria. You've done years of research on this uh, and fascinating ties, uh, looking at ties between uh, religious nationalism in the Russian Orthodox Church, ties to uh, American evangelicals. Um, how how is how do you see this from your perspective? Is the American situation and what you see, this support for Trump and Trumpism, is this something that's an outlier, unusual, or does this fit in with a pattern that you see? So thank you for the question and, and thank you for inviting me um, on this panel. Um, I will try to give that um, external perspective on, on, on the events in, in the US right now. Um, and let, let me start with, with a short story. So in February 2016, I was in Moscow um, and I was doing interviews for my research project on ties between um, Christian right groups in the US and, and in Russia. And I was doing an interview with an act, a pro-life activist. And, and the pro-life activist um, said to me, look, um, Trump has just been sworn into office and, and, and that's really good for us because um, um, he, he has just signed into this uh, the global gag rule um, um, the, um, that will prevent um, organizations like Planned Parenthood of, of coming to Russia and, and, and harming, harming our nation. So um, these activists in Russia, they were very much aware of US policies, they were following those and they also were aware of whether there were an advantage for them or, or of a disadvantage. And yet at the same time, I think these activists were a real exception in, in their national context. 
Um, and why am I saying that? I think that in, in the European context, um, religious nationalism um, is really um, right populist sovereignism to which religion has been added. Mm -hmm. um, the religious content in politics in, in all European countries, Western European countries, was, was, the Christian, was Christian democracy, the Christian democratic parties. Now we know that these in the last decades have become more secular. Um, and, and we now have populist right groups that have discovered religion that was not part of their agenda before. And they have discovered religion for two reasons. One is because of immigration, of large numbers of Muslims. So being Christian in Europe very much means being against immigration of Muslims. And the second reason is, is sovereignism. So it's really being against an um, international human rights and being against the European Union. And, and religious topics have turned out to be really useful and religious nationalism has turned out to be a very powerful tool against legal sovereign uh, for legal sovereignism and against legal internationalism and this is also why why questions which in many ways we thought were resolved in the european context abortion um question about obligatory schooling homeschooling um but also lgbt rights um many of these issues have been brought into national legal systems through the European Court of Human Rights or through international obligations to um, under, under conventions. And, and this is exactly what um, the populists don't like. And that, this is why they, they kind of discover religion also as, as a, and religious issues, pro-life, um, anti-gender um, as, as tools to achieve what they really want and that's legal sovereignty to rule in their own country and to discriminate whoever they want to discriminate mm -hmm. so um, unlike in the US where Eddie just said the main divider is race I think in, in, in Europe the main divider is um, Christian Muslim and, and this question of, of sovereignty and if I want to add, just add one short thing, what's really striking for me um, observing the US uh, situation is the role that socialism plays as a scare. Mm -hmm. um, socialism meaning um, basically secularism. And that's something really that, that you don't find an equivalent to that in, in Europe, because even the, right, the religious nationalists in Europe have very social welfare agendas, very often even more than, than mainstream parties. Thank you. That's a, those are great Absolutely. observations. And, and on that last point, I mean, it's interesting to see where this conservatism in the United States goes, because there is that element of economic populism you know, Biden gets cast as a socialist, but there's a part of the right that's, you know, I think there's a divide in the right here. We have a very libertarian economic model uh, and then those who are very populist economically. Um, uh, Robbie, to you, just one quick point, uh, you know, I, I, I love that analysis, Christina. She said, uh, right national populism uh, in Europe is to which religion has now been added. Are we really that much different how do you see that in in our context is i mean i could sort of see that about donald trump i mean his his whole campaign was something to which religion had been added <laughs> in a very uh, almost grafted on i you would say in, in, in that picture of him in, in uh, front of the church in front of the white house how, do, how does what christina said do you think compare to the uh, u.s situation yeah, you know, I, I think it's a little different here, I think, because of the dominance of Christianity in American life, which is a little bit of a different model than the European you know, model, particularly in the 20th century um, here. And, you know, one of the things um, when I was working on, uh, you know, the, the research for my, for my book, um, White Too Long, uh, was, I mean, the sense of how this commitment to white supremacy has been legitimized by the Christian church and Christian theology from the beginning of the Republic. Like this is not something that got added on recently. 
Um, and uh, that I, I think, you know, what, what I think the last four years have done have exposed uh, that in a way that we haven't seen maybe in a generation. It was very, very, very clear. I mean, you know, Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail, uh, where he's got not the white supremacist burning crosses and th people throwing bricks and spitting on people. That's not who he has in the crosshairs um, in, that, in that letter, right? It is the, you know, so-called respectable uh, religious leaders, the mainstream, you know, more were considered moderates in Birmingham and who were remaining silent. Um, and he, you know, he has this, this line is where he's just writing a dismay. And he's, you know, he says, who are these Christians? Like sitting behind their anesthetizing stained glass windows and that, and that, that word, right. And I think that that is a, you know, that, that, that white Christianity has functioned in some very overt ways. Like, so we don't see very many white Christian leaders today standing up and making the curse of Ham or the curse of Cain arguments from uh, the Christian Old Testament to justify white uh, supremacy, uh, but it kind of morphs, right? Once you get Jim Crow uh, South built, once you get a society that's built uh, to be unequal and, and to disadvantage non-white uh, people, all you have to do to defend it uh, is to remain silent, right? Um, and I think that's what King had in his mind um, it, here. And this, 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 that is in many ways, I mean, there's no more powerful way to legitimize a cultural, a, a way of organizing society than to connect it to the divine will of God, all right? And that has been the role, um, really, that white Christianity has played um, in, in American society. And, and we, we're still seeing it, you know, still seeing that uh, play out today. One, one quick thing I want to add to Eddie's um, uh, comments about uh, Barack Obama um, is that, you know, it, it's not only the case that we have our first African-American president, uh, during that period, but we also go through, this is the sort of height of, or a milestone in demographic change in the country. That is that we pass from being uh, at the beginning of Barack Obama's presidency, the country was demographically speaking, a majority white Christian country. It was 54% white and Christian. Uh, that shifts through his, through his two terms as a president. And by the time we get uh, to the 2016 election, uh, that number is down to 47% percent of the country, right? So we literally moved during the tenure of our first African-American president from being a majority white Christian country to the one that was no longer uh, a white uh, a Christian majority country. And I think that that sense of things, if you listen to Donald Trump's closing arguments in 2016, he was mm -hmm. explicitly appealing to white Christian audiences uh, along these lines, that these changes in the country meant that if they didn't vote for him, they would never see a candidate. He was the last thing standing between them and these changes to the country uh, that wasn't a majority white, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant and white Christian country. Mm -hmm. Eddie, what do you think uh, of what Christina said and also with Robbie? I mean, those, uh, it just seems, you know, those dynamics, there's always an otherizing. It seems in, in Europe, perhaps it's the Christians versus the Muslims, which is a historic, obviously, conflict. Race just seems to be the absolute bedrock division, um, as you said, but there just seems to be the, uh, again, the united, uh, the element of fear, losing, of, of, of those in power losing that power. Is, is that? Oh, absolutely. If, if racial justice is imagined as a zero sum game, and then you combine that with these demographic shifts that are often represented as not just simply the barbarian storming the gate, but really the kind of threatened extinction of white people as we know it, uh, then you can exploit those panics, uh, those fears. You can create moral panics. You can get the kind of book that Rod Dreyer's book is, Live Not By Lies, right? Which is a kind of manual for Christian dissidents, right? Where suffering becomes its central metaphor at the end of that text, right? So you can get all of this as a way of kind of mobilizing um, uh, a particular constituency on behalf of uh, this broader sense of, of threat that's posed by uh, these others. I think, I, I, you know, I kind of stand between Kristen and, and Robbie in this. I think Robbie's right to point to the fact that because this, the unique history of the country where Christianity is so important. Uh, but I, I, I would want to suggest that what happens post the civil rights movement with the passage of the Civil Rights Act of, of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65 and the, good, and the Great Society and how we want to describe it, there is a, there's a shift and we could trace it back to Dixiecrats, I don't know, but there's this shift where 
Christian, white Christians begin to identify in the polity in a particular sort of way that we have to begin to track. And when we see Falwell and others embracing Reagan, and Robbie knows this, right? Embracing the guy who was divorced, embracing all of this, and the yoking together of these two forces in that moment, at the moment in which the Reagan revolution is displacing the New Deal, and the fundamentals of the New Deal, shredding the social safety net, the kind of more, the values that animated the New Deal for what Reaganism would unleash. And white evangelicalism is tethered to that move in very clear ways that, that it, you, we're, so they're not, it's not either or, there's something about the sacralizing of that shift by white American evangelicals, that's really important to note, right? Whether we call it whether we call it Reaganism, whether we call it Thatcherism, whether we call it neoliberalism, there's a sense in which the the kind of combining of these two elements has shaped modern American politics since for over forty years in a very distinct and particular way. It seems to me, uh, Robbie, you you uh, very uh, much stress that it's white Christian nationalism that, that we're dealing with here. Um, but what do you make also of the, uh, the turnout for Trump among Latinos, especially in, in parts of South Florida, uh, obviously a very particular demographic cohort of the, uh, the Cuban exile community uh, going for him. Is, is it still fair to, is, is white, is it still fair to talk about as white Christian nationalism or is this something that could respond uh, to a, a wider demographic, even among other minorities? Yeah, well, the first thing to say is that, you know, Florida is Florida. Um, you know, it is not representative of the Latino community as a whole. Um, it's a very unique uh, place. Um, you know, it, it uh, so I, I think, you know, not make too much out of uh, the South Florida Cuban vote and kind of map that on to the larger Latino vote. Um, I, I see a couple of questions in the chat about Catholics. I mean, I'll just kind of make the point here that it looks like um, also that we saw no movement uh, really from 2016 to 2020 among Catholics. Um, that looks like the, uh, we're still, I should stress also that all the exit poll data that we have right now is preliminary. Um, it's up on the websites, but they are continually reweighting that data as votes come in. So any numbers we're citing now, we should just be clear they're early and preliminary uh, numbers, but the early preliminary numbers um, look like Catholics are right at six and 10 uh, support for Trump. That's exactly where they were um, uh, in 2016. And it looks like Latino Catholics, uh, for example, are two thirds for Biden, uh, right? Uh, about one third uh, uh, for Trump. And that's exactly where they were um, in, in 2016. So, you know, we're, we're not seeing, again, these kind of major shifts. Um, the, and so I, and I, and again, I kind of go back to this thing. What does it say, right? Um, uh, if you're Catholic, what does it say that the biggest dividing line in the church is an ethnic and racial dividing line, right? Um, mm -hmm. we should really be wrestling. I think, you know, for, for those of us who are, who are consider ourselves Christian and are inside, um, you know, the, the Christian fold, whether it's Catholic or Protestant, I think wrestling with this, you know, uh, seriously, um, you know, and, and saying like, what is going on here? Why is it that we can read the same Bible, we can talk about the same Jesus, uh, you know, um, or, or at least use the same syllables when we talk about uh, uh, the founder of the faith, um, and, and, and yet come out so differently, and that they, the only real thing refracting this is, is race and ethnicity uh, here. And, and what does that mean uh, for, for the way we read the Bible, the way we understand our faith, um, you know, it doesn't mean anything good, um, you know, I, I would suggest either for the faith or for the country uh, to, the, to, to the point there, you know, but I do think there's there's bleed over here that that there is an appeal uh, to, you know, there, there's a kind of white Christian appeal here and Catholics uh, are white Christian nationalism. It's important to remember, right, the Catholics who were Italian, uh, who were, uh, 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 you know, who were Irish uh, were not considered white. Um, until the the mid 20th century, right? And and so this 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 sort of like clamor and struggle to get admitted into this privileged category of whiteness has been part of that journey um, mm -hmm. in, in in the Catholic Church as well as the as well as the Protestant Church. Um, and so I, I think that's kind of part of the, part of the, the thing here. I, I do think that the Latino numbers are are um, are, are um, really complex. Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand them. 
Uh, and I, I think we're still going to wait till we get the, fi the final numbers in and kind of see, see where we are. Uh, Christina, related to that, I wanted to pick up on something that uh, our colleague Elizabeth Prodromu at uh, Tufts had been raising in the um, previous session. Does, is Christian nationalism a good term? Is it the right term? Um, or should, like as Eddie said, should we be flipping the term? Should it be national Christianism? You know, <laughs> is it a sufficiently descriptive term? Is it a useful one? I mean, it, it, what it really downplays this term is the big division inside the Christian community. So, I mean, there, there are Christian nationalists, but there, there are at least as many, I mean, who, who, who don't um, support a nationalist line. And um, in, again, inside the Catholic Church, that's very clear right now. I mean, Pope Francis in, in Europe has constantly, consistently argued against Christian nationalism. Um, of the populist right. And, um, and the same, I think, is, is true in all Christian churches, in the Orthodox world or even in the, in the Protestant churches. So in that sense, maybe Christian nationalism is really um, not, not quite um, the right term. Um, and um, and I, again, what, what I find, or what I, what I found in, in, in our research with sort of American evangelicals or Christian right groups that go abroad in order to sort of look for allies. Um, um, I think one reason why the Orthodox Church has become a kind of attractive ally is because the Catholic Church is no longer an attractive ally um, under Pope Francis. And, and um, the Russian Orthodox Church is obviously very, very happy about that. Um, and, and to kind of lead that struggle because it's also their own, um, but for different reasons. Again, for the reasons I pointed out uh, that are more to do with sovereignism and, and, and an ethnic nationalism more than a religious one. Um, what, what really struck me was, and when I said that before about socialism, um, Eddie, you mentioned Rod Dreher's last book, Live Not By Lies. Um, I mean, at one point, um, Andrea made the argument that sort of the U.S. is like um, Russia before the revolution, and, and sort of you know Democrats are the are, are the Bolsheviks, and and they will and 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 Trump at one point tweeted, um, if the Democrats win, they will close the churches, and I mean this is a completely nonsensical statement unless you understand what's the discourse behind it that is apparently persuasive to to a lot of people. Um, and the fact that it is persuasive is, is very hard to understand from a European perspective. Just to uh, echo that real quickly, like that ahead. was this line of, I am going to restore power to the Christian churches was again, part of Trump's closing argument among evangelical voters in 2016. He said that over and over again on the stump. And I would also point to um, Christina's research in her, her lecture. She cites uh, Sarah Riccardi Swartz at NYU about this, and like Rod Dreher is now, he, he went from, I think, Methodist to Roman Catholic to now he's Orthodox. Uh, and that reflects apparently a growing attraction of Orthodoxy here in the United States, which is part of that internationalizing uh, of these things. But, uh, you know, over and against our own church leaders. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm interested again, um, how, um, where is the pushback here? I mean, you see these very traditional Christians and they're telling their own leaders, like in the Catholic Church, Pope Francis, that they don't agree with them. Is there a religious left to push back sure. against this religious right? Uh, Eddie. Of course. I mean, you think about what, just one quick example is uh, the Poor People's Campaign with Reverend William with Reverend William Barber and, and what he has been trying to do, uh, starting with the Moral Mondays movement in North Carolina and how it has, has expanded outward, right? So there's, he considers himself an evangelical, right? And he considers uh, the arguments he's making on behalf of the poor to be consistent with his understanding of, of the gospel. So he's trying to have an argument right, on Christian grounds about what it means to witness as a Christian, that these folk like Dreyer who affiliate with, who see themselves in solidarity with Orban in Hungary, right, who are 
part of these folks who are attending conferences being held over there in the name of, of not only kind of, you know, as Christina talked about, you know, sovereignty, but in the name of maintaining this, this certain kind of Christian identity in the face of, of the hordes of barbarians who threatened everything, it seems, uh, to invoke an older list, an older language and discourse. But there, there is an example, but the problem in, is very difficult in the US to break through because there is the assumption, or, or let me just put it this way, the, the identification in the public imagination of Christianity with these particular actors. And so they have an outsized influence relative to their actual size, it seems to me. Um, and they have an outsized influence relative to uh, what the data seems to suggest about their long-term viability. When we begin to think about where young folk are in relation to these sorts of commitments and the like. So, uh, but I would point our attention to what the Poor People's Campaign with Reverend Barber and Reverend Jean Theo Harris, that what they're trying to do uh, as a clear counterexample that connects back to um, you know, the civil rights movement and, and the progressive Christianity that was expressed in that context and going back to the social gospel of the, at the turn of the century as, as well. But if this turn of the Trump, 20th century. Sorry. But if this Trumpist um, kind of religious nationalism or whatever you want to call it becomes dominant, isn't that just going to alienate young people? I mean, will there, you know, who, who's, you know, we see this, uh, these ranks of the unaffiliated growing. The black churches, uh, to, to a degree, saved us again. Saved Joe Biden in South Carolina, you know, here in this, this election, arguably. Um, but the trends are to, to, you know, young people see, as you say, Eddie, they identify Christianity with this kind of right-wing conservatism. Uh, you know, are they going to sign up for, to, to be a, a spiritual, you know, to congregations that are going to push back against that? I know, Robbie, you have some data on this, right? Yeah, I'll jump in real quick on the viability question, because um, I think it's really what you're raising here. I mean, we, we are seeing, I mean, I, I already gave you the overall white Christian numbers have declined, right? 54% 2008 down to 47% in 2016, and it's 44% today, right? So, you know, that's where we're at. But that's all, what that's everyone. Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, non-denominational. If you're white, non-Hispanic, that's everybody. Um, but what's new, and in the last 10 years, we have seen the decline of white evangelical Protestants who previous decades had been kind of exempt from this, uh, uh, from this decline, but, but not so. In 2008, they're 21% of the population. Uh, 2016, they're 17 percent of the population. Uh, 2020, they are 15 uh, percent of the population. Now, the the challenges um, that um, are, are why that doesn't look that apparent in our politics is because they make up more than a third of the Republican Party base, right? So they're so lopsidedly in one party that they do have an outsized voice in that one side of our politics, and it's kind of captured in, in some senses. Um, you know, I, I think they're sort of mutually have captured each other. The Republican Party has captured evangelicals, and the evangelicals have captured the Republican Party um, in, in many ways. Um, but, but it's notable that that decline is there, and, and it's not that they're losing people across the board. They're losing young people. So among mm -hmm. evangelicals today, only 11 percent of evangelicals are under the age of 30. Right, that's half the number when you compare it to the country as a whole um, uh, that are under the age of 30. Right, so they're half as likely to be under the age of 30 compared to Americans overall. Six in 10 are over the age of 50. Um, right, so I mean, this is in, in the median age is somewhere in the high 50s compared to the low 40s uh, for Americans overall. So you can you can see that, and the and the median age keeps ticking up um, as so they're declining and getting kind of smaller and grayer, um, you know, as as time goes on, but they turn out to vote, right? So that we're seeing in the, in the exit polls, they're somewhere between, uh, you know, 20 and 25 percent of, of the electorate every single time, even as their numbers, uh, and even in this election, it looks like, um, you know, they're about a quarter, again, of voters, despite being only 15 percent of the population. Uh, and and that, that means that they do have an outsized presence at the polls compared to their, um, uh, to their uh, place in the, in the population as a whole. You know, and, uh, and I should, okay. and I, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, David, and I no, should no, say, look, yeah. we, we, we should, we should be very clear that it looks as if Joe Biden will, in terms of the popular vote, will, will receive more votes than any presidential candidate in the history of the country. 
we should, because part of, part of what we're describing here is not only a deep divide, it's also a reflection of the uniqueness of the American political system, right? So I want to be very clear, right? Even though we might see these numbers among Latino voters, we might see these numbers among Black, black men and Black voters, right? We do know that the, re, the, the country, right, has, you know, in some ways re rejected this, at least twice, right? I want, I want us to be, it's hard to wrap our minds around that because of the way in which the electoral college, right, um, works and because of how our political system gives, right, you know, influence and, you know, to, to, to voices that aren't, you know, the majority voices, right? And I understand that. But I want to be just, I just want us to emphasize this outside influence is true within a particular, but for the most part, the country, the level of popular vote has rejected this stuff twice, right? Uh, resoundingly, it seems to me. Uh, but I, that's just me trying to reach for a sliver of hope in the midst of all of this dark. But picking up on that and, and, and going back to circling back to this, you know, why we're here because of this election, um, the, this particular strain of, of, of Christianity seems to thrive on a kind of grievance culture and a persecution complex. I was even, you know, even with Trump in power and the Republicans had both houses of Congress and, and the Supreme Court, there was still a sense of victimization. Mm -hmm. What is going to happen now? Let's say Joe Biden is, you know, confirmed as the winner. Um, is this going to, uh, you know, galvanize them even more? Even, even as we have, Robbie, we've got the numbers shrinking. I want to get your reactions, all three of you, because I don't know how, how this dynamic works in Europe, Christina. What is going to happen? Joe Biden is president. The House of Representatives is Democratic. Uh, are they going to double down? Maybe. Christina, Christina yeah. If I, if I can go first, because I, I, I thought about it. I think in the terms of the transnational connections, which are run by um, American Christian groups, like Alliance Defending Freedom, um, the International Organization of Family, um, the, the connections that Billy Graham um, Association has with Russia. I, I actually think that um, it will galvanize them. It, it, will, it will even, um, because these connections, they started um, much before Trump um, and they intensified during the Obama presidency. And they atten I intensified because these organizations had a very strong sense of we've lost the culture wars back home. So now we take them abroad. And, and this is how it all started. Now we had these four years of Trump where maybe this urge to go abroad seemed less, or less necessary because, um, but I think now if, if this sense of we've lost the culture wars, we go elsewhere, um, will, will, will increase. And at the same time, also this, this sense of, of victimization that you very well described is a very powerful motor for um, seeking out um, allies beyond, beyond the US. Let, let me jump in before Robbie jumps in on this one, because I think combined with what Christina just, because I don't want to follow Robbie's data, right? <laughs> but combined with, with, with Christina's description, I think is, is, is something that's really important that we need to keep track of. And that is the contradictions of, of a particular economic philosophy are in full view. Neoliberalism is collapsing right in front of our faces, right? And it's not just because of the global pandemic. It has everything to do with increasing precarity among workers across the globe, right? That they're seeing their wages flatline. We're seeing this enormous divide in the context of the United States between the top 1% and the top one-tenth of a percent and everyday ordinary people as their wages have really stagnated in so many ways. Even if, even if we talk about uh, some incremental growth over the last four years. So part of what we're seeing is economic crisis, right, happening across the board that will combine with uh, elements of the culture wars, which will then lead to a kind of an intensification of scapegoating, of trying to find those who are the cause for my misery. So this is the kind of perfect environment the perfect soil for a nastiness that we're familiar with, 
So you see in the United States, people are reaching for new languages to kind of describe their current circumstances because the system is seen to have been, have been broken. So some folks are trying to reach for kind of progressivism, but you also see some folk reaching for some very old languages of authoritarianism, of fascism, as a way to respond to their sense of alienation, their sense of loss of ground. And it makes sense that you know, immigrant workers become the object. It makes sense that Black people become the object. This is what happens in these moments. So against the backdrop of what we're describing is the collapse of, a, of 40 years of a political and economic ideology that has governed the, has governed the globe. And so we have to be mindful of that as we talk, talk, talk about these shifts, it seems to me. Bobby? Yeah. Well, look, I, I think I'm with Eddie. I'm worried. Um, you know, I think things are going to get worse before they get better. Um, and, and particularly if, um, if, if Biden wins, Trump loses, Trump leaves office, um, you know, I, I think we're going to be in for a bumpy ride. Um, you know, I, I am typically not uh, one who sort of panics or, you know, in for uh, kind of conspiracy theories, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm really worried. And one thing I want to draw a parallel to, um, you know, is, uh, is 1919. Um, you know, the, the uh, influenza epidemic killed 675,000 Americans across three waves of the virus um, uh, in, in 1919. The other thing that happens in 1919 is Red Summer, right? Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, um, uh, and it's something I'm just going to say straight up. I got a PhD in religion, a uh, lot of history classes. I didn't know what this was till five years ago. I started work on this book. Um, it, it, it was a ser series of, of um, really mass murder of African Americans in more than 30 cities across the U.S., Washington, D.C., Chicago. So this was not just a deep south thing, and it was in places like Elaine, Arkansas, but uh, but it was also in D.C., Chicago, New York. I mean, it was across the country. Uh, and it was this combination of a massive death toll from a pandemic, an economic crisis, um, and it rendered the social fabric of the country in a way that Black people got scapegoated and targeted. And th there were, uh, you know, and I, I think we're in a similar kind of tinderbox. Um, and I, I'm really worried about that and, and kind of want to flag that that piece. Um, and, but I, I think the other thing that we're looking for is leadership among white Christian leaders to kind of lead us out of that direction. Um, I think every now and then we're seeing a little bit of that. We saw it like J.D. Greer from the Southern Baptist Convention after Trump refused to um, condemn white supremacists um, in, the, in the debate, came out the next morning and said, look, none of us should flinch or hesitate about condemning white supremacists. I think that's that matters. Um, you know, I think there's some other signs. I mean, Eddie and I are both from Mississippi. I don't know about you, Eddie, but I never thought in 2020 I'd see the, the state flag of Mississippi changed uh, to remove the Confederate battle flag um, in a year like this. Um, but I think, you know, we certainly have seen it and, and Mississippians voted uh, nearly three to one uh, to accept a, a new flag that since first time since 1894. Uh, that the, the Mississippi hasn't had the Confederate battle flag. I mean, it's flag. So I, I think there's a fight. There's a struggle uh, for the heart, you know, of really white Christianity um, in this country, just to put it bluntly, um, and, and where we're going to go. Um, are we going to retrench? Are we going to, um, you know, kind of operate on a kind of politics and, and religion of white resentment? Um, or I think we're going to look uh, this problem in the eye uh, and really try to reckon with it once and for all. And that the problem really is um, a kind of you know, explicit and at least tacit support for white supremacy. And we got to name it. Um, and if, we're, if we have the courage to name it, and I'm going to, Eddie, I'm sorry, I'm going to steal a little Baldwin quote here from you. But, um, you know, the, the one that stayed with me is Baldwin saying, you know, if we can have the courage and love to do this, um, you know, we can end the racial nightmare, we can achieve our country, and we can change the history of the world. But the only way we're going to get there is if we look this in the face uh, and name it and and say we're going to work to change it. Yeah, and I would again note that both uh, both Robbie's book and and uh, uh, it takes its title "White Too Long" from James Baldwin, and um, and Eddie's book is 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 made references all throughout uh, Baldwin, who's basically his his interlocutor through all of that, and I'm one of those. People who went back and read, you know, The Fire Next Time and all of those books this past summer, having, you know, it was almost all new to me because it's been so long since I read it. And it was so immediate. I mean, it was discouraging, frankly, because it seemed 
as though for all the progress, African-American president, all that kind of thing, there hasn't been real progress. Let's try and if not end on a note of hope, do look to the, forward, to the future as, as we were doing here. But just, you know, how do we get out? Is there a way out of this? Christina had referenced how difficult it is to, to talk with. There's almost a sort of a conspiracy-minded uh, paranoia. And everyone talks about dialogue and unification and reaching out. Um, how do we deal with this almost kind of, you know, uh, just this mindset that seems so difficult to penetrate? Is it, you know, and, and we're talking about Christian, Christians and Christian nationalism, is it theology? Is it, a, is it a spiritual conversion, Eddie, which you talk about? Is there something systematic in changing our electoral structure to get greater representation? What do all three of you see in terms of possibilities for exit strategies, or at least dealing with this in a civil way? Any of you want to go? It's fine. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try. Is there any um, hope? I mean, really, can you? Yeah. Well, or is you know, it just a question of, you know, th this demographic has to get smaller and smaller? I don't know. No, I, you know, look, you know, I'm, I'm a, I come out of a blues tradition. So hope, my hope is always blues soaked. It's a hope, not hopeless, but unhopeful. Um, as Du Bois wrote in, in The Souls of Black Folk. And I just want to echo something that, that Robbie has you know, just said and, 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 and what he has courageously written in, in his work. Um, and, you know, we have to be honest about who we are and what we've done. We have to tell the truth. We have to bear witness, right, to the ugliness, right, of, of our community, what we've done, to be honest with you or to be more direct. And it seems to me that that becomes the precondition for reconciliation, which is the precondition for repair. You know, this is what Brian Stevenson says, right? That truth and reconciliation is sequential. First, you have to tell the truth before you can reconcile, which then becomes the basis for repair. So part of what we want to do is we want to rush to Sunday. We want to rush to resurrection. We don't want to deal with Saturday. I'm not even talking about Friday. Saturday, God is dead, right? And so part of this rush to resurrection is this unwillingness to look, right, the depths of despair in the face. And so, so it seems to me that what Christians have to do, this has to be a, a robust internal conversation about what it means to bear witness to the gospel in this moment, right? And tell the truth about Christians, Christianity and Christians' complicity right, with the, with the ugliness of the world, uh, and then to try to bear witness to the truth of the gospel as we understand it. And that means that we're going to have to confront the rod dryers. That means we're going to have to confront those folk who, in the name of Christianity, are defending a kind of ugliness that we just simply think is antithetical or anathema to our sense. Unless we, unless we engage that battle without the worry of comfort, Right? Unless we engage that battle, we're going to find ourselves having this conversation again. Maybe not us, but our children will, because we'll stay on this damn hamster wheel if we don't. Christina, how do you see it, you know, in, in all of your research in all these different countries? Is there a way out? Is there some way to deal with this? Well, you know, sure there is. I mean, if you think about the countries I study, this is a very, a relatively new phenomenon. I mean, Russia... Uh, in Russia, this is an extremely recent phenomenon. Um, it, it wasn't there in the 1990s. It really starts in the zero years and it becomes um, um, dominant in 2012 with Putin's third term. Um, and I think people haven't even yet realized what's going on. And I think once they will, it's, it's actually quite likely that um, many will dissociate. So in, we're already talking about the end of that pro-Orthodox consensus, which is the base for, for Russian um, religious nationalism at the moment. So in that sense, I think, Alansa, as, an, as, as a sociologist, what we need is, is an analysis. We need to pick apart the stories. Um, we need to sort of really identify what the different 
targets are and aims are um, and, and break open that language um, of promise of Christianity, a kind of positive language that is only being used and instrumentalized for political aims. So I think what, what we really need is, is, is an analysis and, 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 and understanding also the timelines in order to position yeah. ourselves in that story and to say, well, at this and this and this point, that's not my story. And, and I think if it, it's, it's really scholarship also that can do that. And a scholarship well diffused to, and to, to a public that, that can educate for, towards that. Bobby, the last word to you. Scholarship, sure. theology, what do we need? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, look, I, I, I think, when I think about this, you know, and I'm gonna kind of locate myself as a white Christian here, and, and, and that's how I'm thinking about this. You know, I sit in a line uh, of looking backwards at my ancestors and looking forward to my kids and my grand and my grandchildren, which I don't have any. I have kids, but not grandchildren. But I sit in this long chain of being, right? And sort of our job and every generation's job is to take what we've received, take a hard critical look at it, and think about what is the best of it that we want to pass down to our children. What are the problems we want to eliminate? That we don't want to have our children have to have to deal with, right? What can we do? And I think that that's the thing that I think many white white Christians in particular have missed. Like what we have at stake ourselves in this conversation. It's not just because it's bad for black folks, right? It's bad for us. I think, and that's the thing that we've got to kind of internalize here and realize. Like, look, we got to realize what's happened to us, we white Christians. How it has distorted our own faith. How it's distorted our own sense of the country. Right. And, and to Christina's point, I mean, telling part of that is creating new narratives. I mean, we have to tell a different story. What is the story we want to tell that we pass down to our kids? Right. And, and I think we are at this really tough moment where in, in a real sense, um, I've got a choice and, and we white Christians have a choice that we can defend our ancestors. Or we can hand down a healthier faith to our kids, but we can't do both. Right. And I think we've got a real choice to make. And there's some real I, pride, it's not, this isn't just a narrative of loss. There's a narrative of pride, right? And taking, being the people who finally wrestle with this problem, with this can that is, it pick up this can that's been kicked down the road generation after generation after generation and finally deals with it and finally helps to excise um, white supremacy from our faith and from our country. I mean, it really comes down to that. Um, I have some hope that that's happening. I see it happening in local communities. I see it happening in, in the conversations that are happening on the ground all over the country, um, but it's going to be a generational, a generational process. Well, that's all the time we have, and this has been a wonderful discussion, tough discussion, enlightening, maybe even inspiring a bit. Maybe we'll come back <laughs> together uh, sometime in the future, maybe in a year, and, and hopefully we'll have a, a, a positive update, but you've all borne witness in Eddie's words, and I want to thank you all. Christina Stokel in uh, Innsbruck in, in, in Austria, Robbie Jones in, in Washington, and uh, Eddie Glaude in Princeton. Thanks to you all for this discussion. Uh, I'm David Gibson, director of the Center on Religion and Culture at Fordham University. Uh, sign up for our emails, stay in, uh, tuned for future uh, events and discussions like this at this critical moment in the history, not only of this nation, but also of this world. Thanks to you all for, uh, for joining us.